S&P compliant Tesla with earnings gives us a nice 100 point run is our question for today that we focused on in this show. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. Wanted to thank our Patreon supporters. Your support makes a huge difference in the viability of our channel and is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to uh, get access to trading tools, classes, as well as additional shows that will help your investing and trading activity on a daily basis, please join us on Patreon. Link is below. So as we all know, we've been waiting for a long time for Tesla to enter the S&P. In theory, there's about a 20% increase in value that theoretically occurs with the stock price if and when it does enter the S&P. And we believe that this earnings announcement that's coming up on the 21st represents Tesla's latest opportunity to demonstrate to the S&P committee that the parameters that they want to see the company is making an effort to embrace. So there's a phenomenon that's called, uh, that I was surprised to learn about during the last cycle for the Olympics, during the Winter Olympics. And basically what happened is that there was a, a coach who reviewed the process by which you actually have information being given to the judges about how hard an individual had been working in practice combined with the type of things they were working with. And so what this resulted in and results in is a process where there are a lot of judges that already know what to look for to determine whether or not this athlete deserves, you know, one, two, or three on the podium, even before they start performing. So it's more of a confirmation of everything that's there. I'm bringing the, this phenomenon up because uh, one of the interesting things that's been happening with Tesla is just the fact that uh, there is a process that Elon has in which um, both with SpaceX and with Tesla, Elon has a process of sort of outsourcing, consulting, or short-term positions that might impact the company. And so, for example, they may have very senior executives from other companies that are now consultants to come in and help sort of set up certain processes and implement them. But what they tend to do on both, again, the SpaceX and for the Tesla side is sort of hand off once everything is set to very young executives, the management process of everything going on from that point on. So one of my arguments is just the fact that if you look at what's happened with the S&P decision, when you hire a mid-50s, 25-year seasoned executive in that role, you not only get somebody with excellent credentials relative to schooling and training, you also get a bunch of experience. So that experience can blend into how you interact with, with S&P and the Wall Street Journal or the Wall Street community. I mentioned the Wall Street Journal because evidently S&P is actually part of the whole Wall Street Journal process. And as we know, Rupert Murdoch is not a big fan of Tesla and really supports a lot of large organizations that are in competition. So an illustration of my point about this is that when Google chose their CFO, she actually was previously the CFO of Morgan Stanley. And once she was hired by Google, Google now had the ability to have a pretty good command of how the street views the company and also a good command of how to optimize the interest of Google relative to what Wall Street might be thinking and doing. And so the challenge with this lady was that she came in with a high, you know, five to $10 million a year salary, plus probably $100, $150 million in stock. But the folks at... Uh, at Google, really, Google or Alphabet really felt that having that expertise on board was a huge impactor on, on the success of the company, exceeding the, the cost that she represented on the way in the door. In the case of Elon, as you know, the 
longtime CFO kind of left and it came back again, did the role, and then he left, uh, retired again. And then that role was handed to an MBA who's currently CFO who has five years of experience. One of the illustrations of the challenge here that I believe is that he really, he has buddies from the MBA program at, and also probably his prior to MBA, but he really didn't have the depth of knowledge of the processes of the street that might influence something like the S&P because he could have been working on modifying the structure of the balance sheet in anticipation of the S&P entry rather than simply assuming that meeting the gap uh, earnings requirements would get it done and there wouldn't be other, any other issues with Tesla's entry into the S&P immediately. Obviously, that has not been the case. Um, the next thing we wanted to review was sort of sketching out sort of how the numbers have been working for Tesla thus far and how things might be, you know, shifted as we look at the balance sheet that's coming in next week. In particular, what we wanted to look at is the fact that the last four quarters have been kind of strange for Tesla because you're talking, at least in the last situation, $6.5 billion in revenue, but the 250 or so million dollars in profit that was announced was predominantly coming from EV credits. And clearly this seems, the, the use of those EV credits as a solution seems to have become or been an issue in terms of how Tesla may or may not enter the S&P. And so the biggest sort of change we're expecting to see is sort of a, a statement by Tesla in its financial statements that shows that they not only are able to achieve profit prior to the EV credits, but the EV credits actually enhance profits. So a circumstance like that makes, I think, a lot more sense for it to go beyond what the gap requirements are or generally accounting accepted accounting principles might be for the company to be viable as uh, an entrant into the S&P. Um, you know, the statement I wanted to make about the previous point we made is that when it comes to handing out $100 million worth of stock combined with, you know, three to five, maybe $10 million in income to your inbound executives, there is a logic to how and why Elon is sort of forcing costs down of manpower at the top end in the manner that I just described because a lot of things are working well. So what I'm advocating for or suggesting is that there's a need to consider adding some bench strength at the higher end. And the reason is that if in fact uh, a 20 year experience CFO could have gotten them through the S&P door at this point, the higher call it $100 million costs, everything across the board, if you're adding one or $200 billion in market cap from the S&P entry, I think it well justifies spending the money. Uh, so there's not a, hey, it's a huge negative that they did this because they do, do save money by having an experienced insider uh, taking over the role. But I would say that even for myself, I've argued against some of the giant salaries for senior people at certain companies, because it's hard to justify perhaps why they were getting that money. But um, frankly, a command of how did they get this company into the S&P for me is a very worthwhile expenditure of cash to both establish what the parameters are, make sure they're built into the balance sheet and maintaining them. Because another thing phenomenon that can and does happen is that a lot of the former colleagues that work with each other at different firms end up supporting each other and each other's processes and explaining things behind the scenes in terms of what they want to see happen before they invest, et cetera. And I really think that if we have folks who are too young to an experience, they don't have the relationships to drive the conversation for what's necessary in order to successfully navigate this space. Um, we further wanted to validate Elon's process that he's been doing currently. In particular, you'll notice that the EV credits have been used to get the Tesla over the 
earnings versus losses hump. The logic behind it, I think, is really sound. The fact of the matter is every dollar southbound or lower that we see on a car price, it increases the volume of people that can afford it. So Elon's efforts to keep the prices low and therefore have revenue show up in a certain way and then use the credits to get them over the earnings hump is kind of a good idea. But the other thing to think about is something in the range of $500 a car, it may be lower than that or slightly higher, is what we're estimating Tesla would need to adjust, let's say, upwards in order to provide a, a profit quarterly and then use the EV credits as um, as a bonus. And 500 bucks would be impactful, but on a forty, fifty thousand dollar vehicle, I don't, you know, on a percentage basis, I think customers would be comfortable uh, eating that number in order to uh, get into Tesla vehicles. And I think it might have a slight impact on sales, but nothing that's substantive. So I'm actually looking forward to them having made the uh, that change. Um, the final thing that we wanted to look at that we expect to review and that might affect the stock greatly among a number of variables, and we're reviewing only a few of them, is what's going on with the Chinese miracle. In particular, what we're trying to figure out is Elon has indicated by the end of 2020 that 100% of the inputs to Chinese vehicles would be coming from the Chinese market so that they could now get the benefit of perhaps a 50% reduction in raw cost, which is what Elon had suggested earlier in the year. So the question is, how is this going? And this is also powerful because one of the things that's going on is a reduction in the price of the per vehicle that's going on chasing a broader market in China. And so in theory, what can and should be happening here is the price of the Chinese produced vehicles are falling along with the falling cost of the inputs. So Tesla is able to maintain its profit margin while offering cars at a lower price. So this is sort of one of the hidden statistics that I think will have a major impact on what happens with the stock short and long term. And so we're kind of eager to see how all this plays out and uh, very much hopeful to see uh, it play out in the manner that I just described. Um, this wasn't listed in my notes, but you know the other question that's really lurking is how and when does a Model Y start rolling out of the Chinese factories? Because the there's been a sort of a process that's gone on with the Chinese built Model Three. We first had a situation where they were uh, they were building with a backlog of a couple of months back in April, May timeframe. And there's a $2,500 uh, fee to reserve a car then delivered theoretically six to eight weeks after it was ordered. Then in June, we learned that Tesla had scrapped that and had switched to a $200 deposit fee. And you're now getting four, maybe five weeks time before your ordered vehicle was delivered. And then we followed that up in August with a transition where it was announced that Tesla would now start exporting vehicles from the Chinese facility into export markets, both locally in Asia, as well as into Europe. And so this introduced the question mark of, well, wait a second here, it looks like the demand for Model 3 in China has is still existent, but it's tailed off to degree that as you ramp production in the Shanghai facility, you've eclipsed the demand for the Model 3 in the Chinese market. Hence, shipping to other markets makes more sense because, you know, it's a better margin in general than what you could get from vehicles being shipped from the low on the low end of the schedule from uh, Fremont. But uh, there's more profit if it's coming out of China and it allows them to keep uh, the production facilities humming. I think for us, a huge uh, impact on everything is going to be, well, wait a second, if the Model Y is going to hit short term in the next couple of three weeks or four weeks, we now have a huge catalyst uh, for us to push past the 500,000 vehicles for this year. And if we really are, are still delaying on what that shows up, I think it might affect 
not the production of vehicles, because I think they can produce that number of vehicles between China and Fremont, but the delivery of vehicles could be impacted because you're pushing out so many vehicles and not necessarily in a form factor, i.e. the Model Y, um, you know, that consumers are wanting to see. So we'll keep you posted on this and keep an eye on all the variables we just described. I think that, you know, I think the market is generally positive. Tesla's gotten some nice upgrades. And I think that those upgrades are based on combining sort of numbers that one can see with actual uh, delivery numbers that we saw uh, come out. And I just think that there's a number of elements that come together to stabilize and push Tesla's stock price up nicely. But I do believe that a shift in the balance sheet that's S&P mindful, as we've described today, could be a huge catalyst for the stock and cause a lot of folks to make some good money as we head into earnings. Now, clearly, the one variable that's an unknown is the battle uh, that's going on uh, politically regarding the stimulus package seems to be influencing the market in general. But in theory, when you have a short-term power booster like what's happened with earnings and good earnings like that, we do expect Tesla to benefit from that experience and exposure. The next thing that, so we'll keep you posted on all of this and uh, we'll look for more coverage to help us sort of dial in how things are going to work when it comes to earnings for Tesla in the coming week. We want to finish up with our usual health tips. Please remember uh, heading to bed within two hours, uh, minimum four hours optimized uh, of eating is a great idea. It avoids stomach acid from rolling up into your upper respiratory. The second thing is to consider no more than once a week fried foods. The third thing to consider is uh, a 5-2 or some of the other uh, diets that uh, are mindful of fasting because that can also be an impactor on mental health. We also wanted to encourage you to consider a, um, you know, at least some exercise portions there wouldn't be a bad idea. And we also wanted to encourage you in a COVID-driven time of great lovemaking to think about a salad uh, prior because the smaller the meal you have, blood flow is concentrated. Um, let's say if you're eating a big meal, blood flow is concentrated in your stomach. If you had a very small meal there like a salad, et cetera, there isn't a lot for your body to digest. And that flow is now available for the lovemaking space. And it might greatly impact uh, your experience in that space. So we encourage you to consider that as well. At any rate, uh, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Uh, wanted to, again, thank you for joining us. Please remember to like and subscribe. Tschüss German, au revoir French, le Heathrow, Hebrew, Choda Hafez, Farsi, Heido, Swedish, Nihao Ma, hello in Chinese, Trasvice, hello in Russian, Dobrydzenia, Polish, Assalamu alaikum, Muslim. And in Jamaica, we say, enough respect, walk good man. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Bye for now. We look forward to our next conversation.